today we're going to talk about um, 14.3, which is two counting principles in probability. So your essential question, how do you calculate the number of outcomes In an event or sample space. So in our last lesson, um, I showed you how to calculate the total number of possible outcomes and then find the probability of a certain amount of those possible outcomes coming. And what we did was we used like a tree diagram, for example, or we well, we didn't do it, but the textbook itself and in your notes, I had a picture of, for example, every single possible outcome being drawn out for us. Uh, the tree diagram looked more like this in number two. Well, what if you had like a possibility of like thousands of outcomes? Would you really want to draw a tree diagram or draw out all the possible dice combinations? I don't think so. So we're going to talk about how to do it mathematically instead. Alright, so we'll start by talking about different types of events. We're going to have, um, I think we have a total of four different types of events happening. So one type of event is independent events, or one type of um, relationship between events is independence. So, um, Basically, this says that the way that one event occurs doesn't affect the way other events could occur. Um, a perfect example of that is rolling two die. If I roll one die, that's not going to affect how the other die turns out. Okay? Or if I flip two coins, I flip one coin, well, great, I get either heads or tails, but that does not affect if I flip another coin, how that one's going, what the outcome on that one's going to be. All right, so we're going to do another little example here. Um, we're going to use this for several problems. And we'll do it with independent events, but we'll also do it with other types of events. So um, suppose that you, there's a summer camp that offers four outdoor activities and three indoor activities. So here's our four outdoor activities, and here's our three indoor activities. So on Monday, each camper is assigned an outdoor activity in the morning and an indoor activity in the afternoon. In how many ways can the two activities be chosen? Well, this is an example of an independent or of independent events, right? Just because I um, get swimming in the morning, that has no effect on what I'm going to get in the afternoon. I could still get pottery, computers, or music. So, I mean, really what you could do here, and this might take a little while, but you could say, well, if I swim in the morning, then I know that I have in the afternoon three possibilities. And then also if I canoe in the morning, then after that I would have three possibilities, right? And each of those possibilities would be those outdoor ones, the pottery, the computers, the music, right? And I can do that for all four outdoor activities. So in the end, if I count these up, I'll end up with three options after I swim, three options after I canoe, three options after I do volleyball, or three options after I do archery. So I'd have a total of 12 possible outcomes here. So if I'm looking for um, all the different ways that this can occur, basically I'm looking for the number of ways that I can go to an outdoor event in the morning and an indoor event in the afternoon. Well, that's going to equal the number of the outdoor events right, so that would be four, right, which would be my one, two, three, four things, 
times the number of the indoor events, which would be 3 each time. So I'd basically have 4 times 3, which would give me 12. So the number of the outdoor times the number of the indoor, and that gives me 4 times 3, or 12 possibilities. Okay, I went into my mutually exclusive events there. Draw a little line. So now let's talk about mutually exclusive events. Okay, this is where if you, one of the events occurs, it totally excludes the possibility that the other event will occur. Okay, so the occurrence of one event excludes the possibility the other will occur. So here's an example. On the day of the camp talent show, there's time for only one activity. Each camper is assigned either an outdoor activity or an indoor activity. So if you're assigned an outdoor activity, you don't get an indoor activity. Okay, that's an example of mutually exclusive. So I'll write that. Therefore, if assigned outdoor, um, they cannot be assigned indoor. So then how many possible um, outcomes do you have here? You can't do both. You either do outdoor or you do indoor. Well, how many total possibilities do you have? You would have a total of seven in this situation, right? So the way that we could write this mathematically is that the number of outdoor or indoor. Notice how that's different than up here? Up here we wrote and, here we're writing or. And you multiply, or you're going to add. So this is the number of the outdoor possibilities plus the number of the indoor possibilities. Gives us four plus three, or seven. So let's apply this to something besides uh, day camp. So how about um, cards? Okay, hopefully we're all pretty familiar with cards. So there's four different suits in a deck of cards, um, and it's asking you in how many ways can you draw a spade, so that's one of the suits, and a club, that's another suit, from a standard deck of cards. Okay. And every suit has 13 cards. So I guess the question would be, if I drew a spade, I would have 13 possibilities of drawing a spade, right? Is that going to affect uh, whether or not I draw a club? It's not, right? I'm still going to have 13 clubs. If I draw a spade, I'm still going to have 13 clubs in the deck of cards. So these are mutually exclusive events. So we're trying to find the number of outcomes of drawing basically a spade or... A club. We should write in here, in how many ways can you draw a spade and draw a club? I'm going to put just draw here. I think that should go. Because it's basically you're, you're drawing twice. So I can say, okay, the number of spades, well that was 13, right? Plus the number of clubs, which was another 13, so this would be 13 plus 13 equals 26. So I have a total of 26 outcomes in this scenario. Again, mutually exclusive, one does not affect the other. Now, if it was, you know, draw a spade and then draw another spade, well, that's going to be a little bit different. That's going to be a different scenario because now you've already drawn a spade here. Okay, so those are not um, mutually exclusive events. Okay, so let's look at 
our two counting principles so far apply to independent events. So it's the first one that we did. Okay, let's get a highlighter out. So we're going to let A and B be two events that occur independently. Then the number of ways both events can occur is given by basically multiplication. So you basically multiply the number of ways and think about like the tree diagram. Or the second way is let A and B be mutually exclusive events. Maybe I should be highlighting this part too. So I'll highlight independent here and mutually exclusive here. Then the number of ways one event or the other event can occur is given by an addition problem. You add all the different numbers of ways that each of those mutually exclusive events can occur. Okay, now we're going to kind of vary these. So we have our two counting principles where we either multiply or we add. Now we're going to vary these. So one of them is, well, let's talk about dependent events first. So this is the number of ways an event can occur. depends on whether or not another event has already occurred. And that would be like that spade example that I was doing before. If we just said, you know, my first event, I've chosen a spade. Now, what's the probability or how many possible outcomes do I have for choosing another spade if I draw again? Right? Well, the first time you have 13 possibilities, but the second time you only have 12 possibilities. Okay? So those are dependent events. So let's look at these. Our example with our camping, or our summer camp, I think is what it was called. Suppose that on Tuesday, the outdoor activities are canceled due to rain. So each camper is assigned one indoor activity in the morning and a different indoor activity in the afternoon. Okay. So back to this. So we're assigned pottery in the morning. Then how many options do I have in the afternoon? Well, I have two more options in the afternoon. But maybe I was assigned computers. Well, then my two options in the afternoon would be pottery and music. Or maybe in the morning I'm assigned music, my two options then in the afternoon are pottery and computers. You can kind of see it turning into this type of a tree diagram. So let's say, for example, pottery, then we got computers and music. Right? Or I can do computers and I would get those other two. Or I would do music first thing and do the other two in the afternoon. So you can see how many total possibilities do I have. Well, I'd end up with six total outcomes that I would be, I would have, right? Two here, two, uh, two, sorry, two here, two here, and two here. So that'd be a total of six. Basically, to write this mathematically, you'd say, well, what's the number of morning indoor activities? And then, Afternoon indoor. Well, to get that, you're going to do the number of morning times the number of afternoon possibilities. So for us here, it was three times two, or six total possibilities. Okay. There's also these events called overlapping. Overlapping are non-mutually exclusive, okay? So this is if two or more events can happen. If two or more events I'll put, can all happen. So they're not mutually exclusive at all. So here's an example of one of these an overlapping example. 
A teacher asked her students which ice cream flavor they like, chocolate or strawberry. 12 students say they like chocolate and 15 say they like strawberry. These results include four students who chose both flavors. How many students are in the class? So I'm going to draw a Venn diagram for this. So I've got two ice cream flavors. One of them is chocolate and the other one is strawberry. And there are four students who like both. Those four students are here. Okay, so those four students are included in both those that like chocolate and those that like strawberry. Well, we know that 12 students said that they like chocolate. Well, there's four, so how many more, in addition to these four, like chocolate? That's eight of them. And that gives me my total of 12. And then 15 say that they like strawberry. Well, I've already got four that said that they like strawberry. I need a total of 15, so that means that 11 only like strawberry. So this is what we're talking about when we say overlapping. It's this piece right here. Okay, so I guess the question is then, um, how many students are actually in this class, right? Well, we know that there were a total of 12 students who said that they like chocolate and 15 that said that they like strawberry. Well, if I do 12 plus 15, I would get 27. Now, is that what this diagram is saying? This diagram right here is saying that I've got 12 plus 11, meaning I've got 23 students. So the 27, the problem with the 27 is it includes these four students twice. So a better way to do this is to basically take these two, right, and then you've got to subtract out those four students because they've been counted twice. So you can actually have taken this and then subtracted the four and you get your 23 students. So let's do that mathematically. We're going to say what's the number of outcomes of people that like chocolate, oops, chocolate, or strawberry. Right, because that would include everybody in the class. Okay. Well, that's going to be the same as the number of people that like chocolate, which we know was 12, plus the number of people that like strawberry, which we know that number was 15. And then we're going to subtract out, so from this we're going to subtract, now I don't have enough room here, I'm just going to put it down here, the number of people that like chocolate and intersected with, okay, so this is an intersection di diagram or an intersection symbol, strawberry. So this piece right here, this little thing, means the intersection. Okay, well, the people that like chocolate, there were 12 students. Those that like strawberry, there were 15. Those that liked both, right, the intersection there, was 4. And that will give us our 27 minus 4, which is 23 students. Okay, let's go back to cards. I think I've got a shadow here because I've got the sun shining in. Sorry. Oh, well, I'm sure you guys can see pretty well. All right. Suppose you draw a card from a standard deck of 52 cards and want to know the number of ways the card could be a heart or a face card. So, again, a heart is a suit. There are 13 total hearts. Now, face cards, uh, let's see, for every suit, and there's four suits, there are three face cards. So there are a total of 12 face cards, okay? And they're showing you that in this diagram right here. So I've got all of these hearts, okay, which is 13 total. And then for face cards, there's just three per suit. So you got 12 face cards. Now, you're going to have some that are both hearts and face cards. So you've got this intersection here of basically three cards. So when I'm trying to figure out all my possible outcomes, 
I want to know the number of heart or face. All right, well, the number of heart and face, those overlap somewhere, right? There's three of those. So I really want to know the number of the hearts plus the number of the face, and then I'm going to subtract out the number of the heart and intersecting with the face. Okay, so number of heart, we said was going to be 13, because there's 13 per suit. Number of the face, that's going to be 12. And then I'll subtract out what they overlap. There's just three of those face cards that are also heart cards. So I end up with 22 total outcomes. Okay, let's see if I can move this a little bit better for you guys. Try over here. Maybe, yep, I think that'll work. All right, so we've got the same two counting principles, but now we've kind of um, made them a little bit more complicated, right? So if I have two dependent events that occur in sequence, then the number of ways that both events can occur is still by multiplying, but you have to take into account that basically A happened and then B is not independent of A. Okay, so what we say is we say it's the number of possibilities of A occurring times the number of possibilities of B occurring given that A has already occurred. Okay, so given that, for example, like that spade example, right? You already chose one spade, now you're going to choose another spade. There's not going to still be 13 spades there. Okay, um, let's see what we do. Okay, so let A and B be two dependent events that occur in sequence, then the number of ways that both events can occur is given by this right here, where you basically, you can multiply the two events for happening, um, and what we did was we did it with the summer camp, where we said, well, you already got pottery in the morning, so now you're only going to have two options in the afternoon, right? So ours here was that we had three options in the morning, but given that you've already used one of those options in the morning, now you're going to only have two options available for you in the afternoon. The other thing was overlapping events. So applying the same two counting principles, but now instead of just adding your events, like they're mutually exclusive, well now not quite, you have to subtract out where they overlap. If they were truly mutually exclusive, like here for example, where you're just like, I've got two Mutually exclusive events, right? One of them is I can choose an outdoor event, and then I can choose an indoor event. Or I choose some spades. I choose a spade first, and then I choose a club later. Nothing's overlapping at all. Okay? This one has overlapping. Okay, so if they're not mutually exclusive, then the number of ways one event or the other event, or possibly both, can occur is given by, basically, you're still adding them together, but you have to subtract out everything that was overlapping. When they're mutually exclusive, you don't have to subtract anything out, because they never overlap. So, in this example here, well, in both examples, but we'll use this one, it was either a heart or a face, right? I had to figure out, okay, I'm, how many hearts? Well, there's 13. How many faces? But then there's some overlapping, so i got to subtract those out. That wasn't the case when we were talking mutually exclusive. Overlapping is non-mutually exclusive.